ascribed as one of the tallest czars in European history, standing at six feet, eight inches. That's two inches taller than Michael Jordan. Peter the Great is one of the weirdest and wackiest czars to have ruled Russia. He executed his son, Alexei, who was accused of plotting against the czar in Russian. In his bid to modernize Russia, he issued a decree that all men should shave their beards, and those who would not do so were required to pay beard taxes. A tax against beards? What? Join us as we explore the wacky life of Peter the Great and his lasting impact on Russia. And stay to the end to see how the current Putin administration admires him still today. Piotr Alexievich, also known as Peter the Great, was born on 9 June 1672 in Moscow, Russia, into the family of Tsar Alexis. His mother, Natalia Kirilovna Narishkina, was the second wife of Tsar Alexis. Unlike the sons of his first wife of his father, Peter proved to be a healthy child, full of life, and very inquisitive. However, Tsar Alexis died in 1676 when Peter was only four years old. In the turn of events, his unhealthy elder half-brother succeeded to the throne as Fyodor III. But the fact remains that the power fell into the hands of Miloslavskis, a relative of Fyodor's mother. Miloslavskis interestingly pushed Peter and the Narishkin circle aside deliberately. Fyodor died without a child in 1682, and a very fierce power tussle ensued between the Miloslavskis and the Narishkins. The Miloslavskis wanted Fyodor's brother, Ivan V, who was very delicate and feeble-minded, to be on the throne. The Narishkins stood behind the healthy Peter. Representatives from the various orders of society assembled in the Kremlin and declared their allegiance to Peter. Thereafter, Peter was declared the Tsar. However, the Miloslavsky sect would have none of it, and thus they exploited a revolt of the Strelsky of Moscow, which are the musketeers of the Tsar's bodyguard. These musketeers killed some of the supporters of Peter, including Monteviev. Soon after, Ivan and Peter were then proclaimed joint czars. However, due to Ivan's ill state, his 25-year-old sister Sophia was made regent. Being clever and highly influential, Sophia took total control of the government, while Peter, who had been excluded from public affairs, lived with his mother in a village near Moscow and was often cautious of his safety. All of these happenings left an indelible impression on young Peter and fostered his negative attitude towards Strelzy. Sophia excluded Peter from government affairs, which was pivotal to his exposure to other matters that would later help his rule. It was here that he lived in the German colony and became friends with the inhabitants, loving their culture and seafaring. Peter had a strong appeal for sciences such as navigation, fortification, and mathematics. A model fortress was built for his amusement, and it was here that he organized his not-so-serious troops. However, in 1687, the Preobrzezhensky and Semyonovsky Guards regiments came into place. These Guards regiments would soon become the nucleus of the new Russian army. In the early years of 1689, Natalia Narishkina arranged a marriage for Peter to the beautiful Eudoxia, also known as Fyodorovna Yevdokia. This political marriage was to announce Peter's maturity, but it failed and she was relegated to the convent. On the flip side, in August 1689, a new revolt occurred by the Strelzy, which she wanted to use to her advantage, but fell into Peter's favor. She was banished to the convent at Novodevichy and was forced to become a nun immediately after the Strelzy Rebellion in 1698. Though Ivan V still was a joint czar with Peter, he was just a figurehead with no measure of authority. The administration was now largely given over to Peter's kinsmen, the Narishkins, until Ivan died in 1696. Peter continued his military and nautical activities and sailed the first seaworthy ships that were built in Russia. The games he played had now proven to be credible training for the task that was ahead. At the inception of Peter's reign, Russia was significantly a huge force to be reckoned with, but they had no access to the Black Sea, the Caspian, or the Baltic. And Peter's main goal was to win the outlets that linked to these places. The first moves taken in this direction were the initial campaigns of 1695 and 1696, intending to capture Azov from the Crimean Tatar vassals of ancient Turkey. These campaigns could be observed as fulfilling Russia's commitments, which had been started during Sofia's regency, to the anti-Turkish Holy League of 1684, which included Austria, Poland, and Venice. On another wing of thought, these campaigns were also intended to take the stronghold of the southern frontiers that the Tatars may use to raid the Russians, and also have access to the Black Sea. The first campaign was a mess and failed. 
However, Peter was not deterred as he swiftly jumped into action by building a fleet at Varnege to sail down to the Don River, and this was strategic to capturing Azov in 1696. He sealed the victory by building a naval base at Tangerok, the Grand Embassy of Peter I. Having sent some young nobles abroad to study nautical matters, Peter went with this so-called Grand Embassy into Western Europe. This embassy consisted of about 250 individuals with Fyodor, Alexievich, Prokopi Voznitsyn, and Franz Leffert being the Grand Ambassadors at its head. Their main goals were to examine international situations and to strengthen the anti-Turkish coalition. This embassy was also to gather critical information about Europe's economic and cultural life. In his trips, he traveled with a different identity as Sergeant Pyotr Mikhailov, while acquainting himself with the matters and situations in the advanced countries of the West. For four months, Peter studied shipbuilding, working as a ship's carpenter in the Dutch East India's company's yard at Sardau. After this, he proceeded to Great Britain, where he furthered his study of shipbuilding. Here, he worked in the Royal Navy's dockyard at Deptford, while also visiting factories, arsenals, schools, and museums, and went as far as attending a parliamentary session. Back in Russia, the services of foreign experts had been engaged for work. As a diplomatic man of the Grand Embassy, Peter engaged in negotiations with the Dutch and the British governments for an alliance against Turkey. However, these maritime powers had no interest in the plan, since they were more concerned about the problems that would soon turn out to be a crisis for them in the War of the Spanish Succession. The Execution of the Strelzy After England, Peter went on to Austria to negotiate for a continuation of the anti-Turkish alliance. While he was there, he received news of a fresh revolt of the Strelzy in Moscow. In the summer of 1698, he was back in Moscow where he was able to suppress the revolt. In the course of the event, hundreds of Strelzy were executed, the others who rebelled were exiled to a very distant land, and to bring permanence to such peace, the Strelzy Corps was disbanded. The Northern War, 1700 It became obvious that Austria was not going to bend to Peter's pleas to join forces, but they were also interested in the Spanish succession. Peter knew that it would be an impossible task to instigate a war without alliances against the Turks, and this made him abandon his plans of pushing forward from the Sea of Azov to the Black Sea. However, by the Russo-Turkish Peace of Constantinople, which occurred in Istanbul in 1700, Peter retained the possession of Azov. He turned his attention to the Baltic region instead, in consonance with the tradition of those who were before him. The Swedes occupied the regions along the Baltic coast, and they hindered Russia from getting to the Baltic. In response to this behavior and Peter's desire to dislodge them, he formed an alliance with Saxony, Denmark, Norway, which ensued into a strong war in 1700. This war spanned 21 years and interestingly became predominant. In the plan for and the sustenance of the war, Peter I displayed strong willpower, diplomacy, unrelenting energy, generalship, and outstanding skill of statesmanship. He mobilized all resources in Russia and was very detailed in the course of events. He could be seen undertaking different roles in the battle like being a sailor, an officer, or anything, such behaviors that are considered as risky to his person. The defeat of the Russians at Narva, 1700, came quite early into the war, but this did not make Peter lose hope. It was the ingredient needed to push forward his quest against the Turks. As he would later recount, the defeat was necessary to drive away sluggishness and make me put in the work. In 1704, the Russians captured Narva, and in the other battles of Lesnia in 1708 and Poltava in 1709. It was in these battles that Charles XII of Sweden suffered a great defeat in his attempt to forestall the advancement of Peter's army. Peter also joined forces and fought in the naval battle of Gangel in 1714, which was Russia's first major triumph at sea. He kept on with his diplomatic trips to Pomerania, Denmark, Germany, Holland, and France from 1712 to 1717. On the other hand, he had begun the construction of the city of St. Petersburg on the banks of the Neva River and made it the new capital of Russia. By the Treaty of Nystad in 1721, the eastern shores of the Baltic were given to Russia, making it easy for Russia to dominate Poland. To celebrate this, the Russian Senate changed Peter's title from Tsar to the Emperor in 1721. President Vladimir Putin would later compare his style with Peter the Great in admiration. The poorer populace of Russia bore the hardest parts of labor during the battles which amplified their suffering and led to a revolt that was eventually silenced viciously. The Turkish war, however, had been in place in 1710 while Peter was on the move to conquer more lands. The Turkish declared war on Russia and outnumbered the Russians. However, diplomacy and the signing of the peace at Adrianople in 1713 
led to the relinquishing of Azov to the Turks, leaving Peter to focus his battle on the Swedes. Peter had a son, Tsarevich Alexis, born to him by his discarded wife, who grew to become a rebel to Peter's reign and supported everyone who had the same mind. However, Alexis was sent to prison and charged with treason, where he was tortured and eventually died in prison. Peter the Great had already married Catherine I in 1712, who bore many other children for him. Peter continued his campaign against the Persians, even though the wars he fought had negatively affected his health. He won the western and southern shores of the Caspian in 1723. In one of the continued wars in Central Asia in 1724, he saw some of his soldiers in danger of drowning from a ship in the Gulf of Finland. He jumped into the icy water to help them, a true leader. After then, he became ill and died on January 25, 1724 at age 52, leaving an empire stretching from the White Sea to the Caspian and from the Baltic to the Pacific Ocean. His widow, Catherine I, whom he had crowned an empress in 1724, succeeded him temporarily till his grandson, Peter II, came of age.